I merely am very much interested in personality. So that when people come into my meeting, they say, why do you make me small? The fact is, when you're confronted with a crowd on the domain, you don't know who's in your meeting. There may be intelligent people in your meeting, but you can always be sure the biggest majority are stupid. That's why they're in the mob. Now, what you've also got to know is this. A crowd is always cowardly. Let the mob get out of hand, and the mob will savage you. So when I see the crowd beginning to lose interest, I provoke some idiot into interrupting me. When I get the idiot, I'm like a butcher with a block. Every butcher needs a block, and he's a very lucky man when he gets a block hit. So, what do I do? On the platform, I divide the crowd. After all, the world always needs scapegoats. The Jew has been a scapegoat. The Negro has been a scapegoat. You need scapegoats. Somebody's got to die. And if I don't find a scapegoat, you may kill me. But if you're going to kill anybody in this meeting this afternoon, it will be him, led by me. So I've got the crowd divided. When the crowd's divided, they can't unite against me. I've got the crowd laughing. When the crowd is relaxed, I can put my propaganda deep below. And what is my propaganda? Communism is filth, and Nazism is filthier. Now, you'll remember that for the next 50 years. Read the papers, boy. If you don't read the papers, you will know that in the last war, Churchill bombed Dresden and thousands of women and children died who were not soldiers but working in factories. What? Oh, they, oh, I see. The women and children in Dresden shouldn't have been there. A doctor won't cure you. He will drug you. You go into the hospital with one sickness, you come out with two others. And two-thirds of the drug addicts in Australia they are made drug addicts in hospitals and by doctors. But the drug racket is worth millions in Australia. And not only is the drug racket worth millions, but retail groceries. The bloody groceries are not concerned with food value. They're concerned with profit. And as long as the thing fills you up and it tastes sweet, they'll sell you any bloody thing. The Catholic Church is involved in, and don't laugh, the biggest racket are the brewers. And if you knew to what extent the Catholic Church is involved with the brewers, and if you don't know, go and read Frank Hardy's book, Power Without Glory. Read about Cardinal Mannix in Melbourne, mixed up with every bloody criminal from Squizzy Taylor downwards, and mixed up with all the rest of the breweries, and every time a bloody brewer dies, he leaves his money to the church. Why? Because alcoholics and drunks are people with a guilt complex who go on the booze to get away from their spiritual sickness. You're going to have trouble in Australia with black power. And who's creating the trouble? The World Council of Churches. And why are they doing it? Because the church is bloody well dying on its feet and it's trying to save itself by linking up with rebellious and revolutionary movements. By what right does a Catholic priest tell me what to do? By what right does a Protestant clergy tell me what to do? I don't believe in their damn God. And even if he did exist, I'd be a devil worshipper. I don't mind a Christian having freedom to be a Christian. But the atheist must have, a re have the freedom to be an atheist. And I, my religion is witchcraft. I have a right true to my religion, provided I don't force it on anybody else. And my religion tells me that one of the faults of Christianity is they've not only made sex filthy, they've degraded women. They've made women as if they're something filthy too. They made women as if women were the temptress, women that called all the bloody trouble. This world 
will be a much better world when women are liberated to the extent of playing a full role in society, not imitating men, but being women. That's what we need. And freedom means my freedom, not to intrude on somebody else. And I believe in personal freedom. I believe in people's right to be kinky. But you, there's not an eccentric amongst you. Your uniform, your stylized. I can tell who you are, where you come from. I can even tell you where you're going. Why do I teach individualism? And what value to you is socialism in Russia? You're living here. And what value to you is Shintoism in Japan? You're living here. And what value to you is the fact that England exists? The fact is, you're living here. Therefore, the whole of your life is encompassed in your physical, mental and spiritual existence. It is your individuality which is important above all things. Learn that and you've learned the most important thing in the world. What does it matter to you that Cassius Clay is a great fighter? Only because you can enjoy watching a great fighter. Only because you can. In other words, to me, Webster is the greatest. And to every one of you, I would teach that you should be great for yourself. Webster, that's me. I was born in London before the First World War, a year before the First World War, of a large family. And that, of course, was a good beginning. But I was physically inferior. Physically inferior. So I was a miserable little creature. And it was at this time that I, I learnt that I could speak and hurt people with my tongue more than they could ever hurt me or me them with my fists. I don't pay much attention now to my childhood. There wasn't anything really exciting about it. And I don't really begin to think of life for myself until I had left school. It was at this time that I went to work at the Salvation Army headquarters. I worked there for two and a half years. There's not much to be said about it except that it cured me of Christianity. And um, this was the beginning of the Depression, the Great Depression of the beginning of the 30s. And I went straight from the Salvation Army headquarters, where I'd thrown in my job, down to the Labour Exchange. And at the Labour Exchange, I saw a fellow speaking on the platform, full of bitterness and hatred against the injustices, you know. And I'd come from the slum, therefore I knew something of these injustices. And I was in a very, very rebellious mood. And it seemed natural for me to, to become associated with these people. So I began marching on the streets and demonstrating and carrying the red flag. And I still had the scars on my arms where from carrying the red flag and the battles with the police in the days of the uh, Depression. And it was at this time again that I began and discovered what was for me the real beginning of life. Speaker's Corner Marble Arch. Speaker's Corner Marble Arch was a whole new world for me. It was my university, and it was here I began my education. First of all, in the small groups, then by heckling the speakers, and I learned that one doesn't really have to be an authority upon anything except um, sheer bluff. And I've been using this ever since, of course, I'm something of a con man, but every demagogue is this, just this. Every demagogue must have something of imagination. And uh, you have to capture people's imagination. And this is what platforms are about. This is what speaking is about. Within a very short time, a matter of a couple of years, from being on hunger marches, from being on unemployed demonstrations, I was in the leadership of the unemployed workers' movement. I was on the London leadership of the Communist Party. I was on the national leadership and a foundation member of the Young Communist League. And then I went into leagues of militant godless all these were subsidiary organizations of the communists. At this time, I got married too. I got married in Paris to a girl who had been born in Berlin. And we both got married. She couldn't speak French, neither could I. So we got married in front of the mayor, the Marie. And in this case, I had to say, oui, oui. And so 
the thing was performed and I had my first wife and my first experience of the fruits of legitimate sex. And, and thoroughly enjoyed it, of course. Uh, then this whole thing came to an end with the beginning of the war. And the war period for me meant a period of, of uh, involvement. But finally I ended up as a labour supervisor, extremely well placed uh, and doing quite well for myself. England, after the war, was so dull, I gave the game away. Came to Australia as a migrant, full of hopes and, of course, expecting sunshine all the time. And, truthfully, I found it. One thing which has been very, very sure is that Australia has been good to me. And I don't have any whinging, not even any complaints about the damn place. Why should I? I haven't worked since I've been here. But then, I haven't worked for now 40 years, not since the days of the Depression anyway. But when I came here, I first went to the Speaker's Corner in the Yarra, on the Yarra Bank, Melbourne, and discovered that the Speakers were all third rate, and that they needed somebody like me. In fact, it became my duty. So I spoke, and from the very t first told them that if they wanted me to speak, they had to pay me. And they've been paying me ever since. But now, what about my ordinary life? I speak on Sundays, I produce a paper. This involves a great deal of reading. It involves a great deal of study. But also it brings me in contact with so many hundreds of people. People so that I may be walking along the street and people come up and want to talk to me. They expect me to talk to them. For you, you can say that there's, there's no program. I enjoy my sex and um, this too is pretty hectic because I have a, a, a very wide range. I've been married again since that marriage in Paris. I have a second wife. But then um, I'm also bisexual and, and um, thoroughly in love with life. And I like to feel things. Feel them spiritually. I like to feel them mentally. I like to feel them spiritually. So my day-to-day -day life is one in which I find I don't have any plan. I don't have any kind of, uh, of set purpose. My nights are spent in reading. My mornings are spent in bed. And my daytime is spent in walking, talking, and just thoroughly mixing with people and enjoying people's personalities in relationship to mine. So I've been back to England two or three times since then. I've been all over the place several times. But quite frankly, I like Australia. I like England, of course. I like England because it's a ruin, and I love ruins. <laughs> but I like Australia because Australia's got no past. It goes on the way it is. It's got no bloody future either. <laughs> But I like Australia because we can really create something here. We really could make something here, you know, if we wanted to. If we'd give away all our Western bloody ideas and realise that Australia is a new centre, we could take the wealth of Asia. We could take the wealth of Africa. We've got our own Aborigine peoples. We've got to stop all this white Australia bloody rubbish. We've got to know that Australia can be a completely new society. We can produce a new breed here. And I like Australia because it allows me not only to dream, it allows me to do something. I'm not a socialist. Don't belong to any damn mobs. He came here, I think, around about 1966. Uh, was the first time somebody said to me, there's a man up in the audience named Webster. I'd never heard of him. I wasn't aware that he was a domain orator. But I remember the first questions he asked. Nobody could ever forget the questions Webster asks of anyone. And they were a pretty savage kind of an attack on Christianity. At that stage, Webster spoke about himself as being Muhammad John Webster. In other words, he claimed to be a Muslim. Butchered, butchered, men, women and children. And then he starts talking about killing children in the womb, as if it was something that you shouldn't do. They put in millions on the battlefield, Protestant and Catholic. They set quiet whilst women and kids are being butchered in Vietnam. And women and kids are being butchered in Vietnam. Yet we've got to get indignant because using a French letter, you're strangling a sperm. And this is the bloody nonsense that the Catholic Church gives us and these pious bloody holy rollers. One of the most important things today is birth control because the earth is polluted, polluted by scientists who think the machine is more important than it is. The earth is polluted by these stupid bloody ideas of these advertising agents, the earth is polluted by too many bloody children. And the kids don't ask to come into the world. You have the kids for your own purposes, mostly out of bloody ignorance. 
other people want children because they want to dominate them. So they go and adopt children. This is one of the most criminal things that ever happened. A frustrated old tart goes and adopts a child and then poses all her bloody nonsense on that child. And so does some stupid bloody father. The kids are the victims of ignorant bloody parents. We get a lot of complaints from church people who uh, say, you don't have Webster speaking in the theatre or the chapel, do you? And I've had official complaints by church bodies who said, you know, they're going to make some kind of stormy protest about it. But as far as that is concerned, Webster represents the wide spectrum of people who are, are involved in the chapel. Hello, Hello there, Sue. Nice to see you. How are you? And you help? What's going talking on? about Webster here. Devil work. And the same silly creatures are as scared of the bloody devil they worship as the Christians are of the God they worship. And God and the devil can both be given the sack. I don't think he's the devil he makes himself out to be. I think that in order to stimulate people, or turn people on, if you like to use that phrase, in order to stimulate people mentally, Webster says the provocative thing. I wouldn't be here if it weren't for the fact that I had a mother. And I wouldn't be here if it weren't for the fact that my mother had a relationship with a man. In this case, it was my father because the law insisted in those days. Wouldn't have made any difference if it didn't. Therefore, a woman's body is not dirty. The whole of a woman's body is beautiful. It's beautiful. And this is true also of a man's body. Therefore, when we hear of people having a naughty or this, it's merely that you and I have got to get new ideas. We've got to learn to respect women, and women have got to learn to respect us. But we don't respect women by becoming Puritans and wowsers. We don't respect people by running away and hiding things. The whole of our body, physically, mentally and spiritually, has been made into a perfection. And if you say that a woman is a woman, she's not only a woman in terms of fact having two big tits if she's lucky, she's also got a cunt. And that's a damn good thing to have if you want to be a woman. And it's a beautiful thing. And it's sickening to hear these people going around with their slimy, creepy, bloody ways trying to downgrade woman. That woman is something dirty. Woman is a temptress. Woman is a beautiful thing, physically, mentally and spiritually. What is he like behind the scenes? On the surface, he sounds like a bit of a demagogue, a dictator. But I believe Webster is one of the most humane people we have in our community. He is very sensitive to people's needs. Constantly, even though he may attack uh, people that don't help themselves, he'll come and ask if he can help somebody. This is behind the scenes quietly. He won't parade his virtues of uh, helping others in public. When you stop paying me, I stop entertaining you. I'm interested in helping you to, ex to experience things. I'm interested in helping you to grow up mentally. But I won't lose any sleep if you drop dead tonight. I won't lose any sleep at all. After all, I don't know most of you. Bloody good job if I never know you. Stupid as you are. So buy the paper, get out and keep out. An amusing incident that took place just a few months ago at the chapel. I was sitting downstairs in the office meeting with some young people and suddenly we heard the sound of running fo uh, uh, footsteps. Webster was supposed to be speaking in the theatre and all that I heard was somebody calling out, Webster's been hit. It sounded at first as if somebody was saying Webster's been shot. But what had happened was that an Arab young person, a, an Arabian young man, had, had jumped down from the uh, theatre gallery onto the stage and hit Webster on the jaw. And I raced out to the theatre to find Webster fully recovered. In fact, uh, in typical Webster fashion, he leaned across to me quietly so that the crowd wouldn't hear what he was saying and said, think of the good publicity this will give me among the Jews. And in these papers, if you just read the damn things, you will find that here are ideas. You don't have to say, I believe in Webster. You don't have to read it and repeat it. Read the thing, think about the thing, discuss the thing. Come back and talk to me about it if you will, provoke me, oppose me if you will. But start thinking, otherwise you're merely another lost generation. You are another lost generation. And you can cackle at your old man, but at least your father's lived in a time when Queen Victoria and the Empire were stable. At least they had some security. You got none at all. And you're becoming a crowd of neurotics because you're rejecting your fathers and you don't know where you're going. Start thinking. How have we influenced John Webster? Well, I suppose I'm the best person to say 
something about the changes in the man because I've been involved with him continuously since about 1966. I think Webster is more concerned about being constructive uh, now than he was when he came here. I think he was merely interested in argument in 1965. He made his money by arguing and he still makes his money. He makes his living, if you like to put it that way, by arguing. But I think Webster wanted some point in, in the world where he could be involved constructively in leaving something behind him. There's a tremendous possibility here. If we would only see this possibility, if we could only make a new relationship with Asia, Africa and Europe and see ourselves different from all of them. That's why I like the Wayside Chapel. I never found a place like the Wayside Chapel in London or in the other places. I like it because even in this Wayside Chapel you can see new possibilities. You can see people come in, you don't say, are you Catholic, are you Protestant, are you Jew, are you Muslim? You come here and you can express yourself. You can express yourself. This is what old Knox has done. You can express yourself. I think that many people underestimate Webster. There is the bravado on the outside. There is the uh, sensationalism. He couldn't sell his paper on the domain, for example, without having uh, that kind of sensationalism uh, and the emphasis on sex and the emphasis on devils, the emphasis on these things. But I think if you talk quietly with Webster, if you get him alone somewhere, you'll find him to be a person who has a very deep understanding of life. So you see, something is wrong somewhere. Maybe we need to return to the teachings of Jesus and get away from the teachings of Paul. Maybe we need to read a bit more, study a bit more. Maybe we need to love each other a bit more. <laughs> my love doesn't make things. After all, my love is merely that people get together and they, they know that coming together is bodies. And it's nice to get hold of another body. You can't live fancy living in complete isolation. I don't know if any of you have ever been in complete isolation. I was once in solitary confinement. And you can put your hand out. You can put your eyes out, and you can put your ears out, and you can put your bloody tongue out, and you can feel nothing. The beauty of life is that when there's somebody close to you, that even if you don't touch them with your hand, you know, there's a kind of magnetism between bodies. You can touch. And I like being with people, I even like you, as sweaty as you are. Keep your hands to your bloody self. <laughs> <laughs> One person in this crowd who I wouldn't touch is you. <laughs> Since the last time I went with you and got syphilis, you're out. <laughs> uh, Webster's no longer a, a young man, he's not an old man either. But I think that Webster would like to feel that he, he not only stirred people up, but he left something behind. And here at the chapel, Webster has contributed in helping to make what we call the family of man a reality. And I belong to the family of man. Why? I don't know. Because I've gone far beyond man. I'm Superman. <laughs> and the family of man we see as 21st century religion. The churches won't exist as we know them in the 21st century. We won't have the divisions between Buddhism and Mohammedanism and Christianity and Judaism. There'll be a unitary movement in the world and we believe that the family of man that Webster has helped to shape at the Wayside Chapel as one of the co-founders of the family of man is in fact one of the lasting contributions that he will have made, not only to the Wayside Chapel, but we believe to the whole world. And so his involvement here is not superficial. It's not something transitory, but it's something that will have a permanent effect, I believe, not only on the life of Australia, but on the whole life of the world. Quickly now, further, I believe in free enterprise, and I believe in individualism. You will be whatever you want to be. The only thing I want to be a monk, do you? I want to be the Pope or nothing. That's why I left the Salvation Army. They wouldn't make me into a general. I won't be subject to anybody. Webster for general. Any Catholic here, name the Pope and I'll tell you the scandal. <coughs> let the women go to work and let the man stay at home. Let the women stand in the bus and let the men sit down. Let the men go to the shops and get the latest fashion, and let the women dress in dreary suits week after week, month after month, year after year. It's you stupid bloody men who are enslaved. Quickly now, got another five minutes. Anybody with a paper wants a question?
Got a paper? The sexual revolution is the most important revolution. Let's get rid of Christianity. Give God the sack with rat sack. And Jesus said, or rather Paul said, people with long hair won't go to heaven, that puts you out. I have no intention of going. I'm staying down here, joining the agricultural movement and rooting. If you want to be so bloody clever, open your own ass and shove your head up here. <laughs> Come on, service me, service me. Whip me while I'm in the mood. Let me suffer. You name him, and I'll show that all your pokes, none of them have ever been celibate. They've all had children while treating celibacy, and all of them have made the Vatican into a brothel. Be warned, love, be warned. Copulation with him and you'll give birth to a sergeant's pie. <laughs> but how can you enjoy sex? First of all, you've got to have a good body, like mine. <laughs> You're right, criminals are fools. But not all criminals, only Darcy Dugan, because he's trying to get away with it by violence. Max Mann didn't try violence, and he's a criminal. <laughs> Whitlam didn't try violence, and he's a criminal. And Elizabeth's representatives in Australia, they're not violent, they're criminals. And they're living in bloody luxury, you half-wit. That's why I'll teach you about hypnosis. Hypnosis will teach you how to lob with finesse. None of the others come out and say that, only Webster. And she will only get up to let the milkman into the bed which you warmed up. <laughs> Let's talk about food. Food. Food! Now look, behave yourself. Get a paper. You're all right, you look all right. Get a paper before you go off. Now, don't do that, otherwise they'll take you to Taronga Park. Right. Further questions? Questions? What's wrong with you? You're not locked up, you poor bastard. Of course you are. You can get rid of me by not buying the paper. Because if I didn't make money, I wouldn't be here. Old Pope John... Dear old Pope John, the silly old Queen, Pope John the 23rd was the second John the 23rd. The first one was put out of the papal chair because of sodomy, fiddling, thieving, blaspheming. In fact, one Pope was a devil worshipper. Your Pope, what a bloody mob they are. I've been speaking for 21 years here. That's an achievement. And it is, it is acknowledged by everybody that I'm not only the best speaker who's ever been here, but I'm equally well the best speaker who's ever likely to have been here. Where are you, Rod? Bring the paper over here. Where are you? Those who haven't got the paper have the decency to come and get it. Otherwise, I hope on your way home you get an accident. Where are you? Thank you, sir. Oh, yeah. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Look for this kind of two chairs, and you won't go far wrong. And then you just go in and ask the Rosie Norton. Glad you enjoyed it. Did you buy the paper? Well, buy the bloody paper. I'll make sure you won't enjoy it. All right. Better. <laughs> Thank you.